Hi everybody and welcome to Lecture 7 of Digital VLSI Design at bar Ilan University. I'm Dr. Adam Tiemann and today I'll start discussing placement. So let's start with a short introduction to today's subject. Let's remember where we are in the complete design flow. So we started our um, course talking about the entire flow of making a chip. It started with some definition and planning stages that we didn't go much into in this course and we discussed a little bit about RTL design, um, discussing how to write Verilog for synthesis and how to write test benches and verification we just did some direct test benches. Our course really started at logic synthesis when we synthesized our design into a technology mapped gate level netlist. Then we went over down to physical design stage which uh, we've been dealing with for the last two lectures. We started with importing the design into the place and route tool, um, defining our multi-mode, multi-corner and so forth, and then drawing up a floor plan. Today, um, we're gonna go into placement um, where we have a design with a floor plan that has pre-placed blocks, some power routing and so forth. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take all our net list, which is full of all these standard cells and actually decide where each and every single cell sits in the standard cell or core rows. Uh, just a question, a short question to ask before we um, start discussing how to actually do placement. When people say chip size, what are they exactly talking about? So when somebody says, uh, I'm building a hundred million gate ASIC, how big is it actually? Well, when we look at a real design, we can see that small cells dominate. And um, Rob Rutenbar uh, made this plot several years ago. It took a 206,000 uh, gate IBM ASIC, and he looked at a histogram of what the cell sizes are and you see that the width of the cells there are very few very tiny cells but there are a ton of small cells in fact most of the cells are um, small there are very few big cells probably the cells over here are some macros some IPs that are really really big but there are whatever flip-flops and so forth may be on the right side here but most of the cells really are small so small cells dominate um, therefore when we discuss what a hundred million gate ASIC is, we usually discuss them as equivalent small gates. Okay, um, We can also consider these big macros to be uh, many, many small gates. So when we say a hundred million gate ASIC, we actually usually say gates as equivalent NAND2 gates. So we'll take NAND2, it could be uh, some other gate, and in many of the tools you can actually define what this um, what this actual reference gate is, but uh, say a NAND2 because CMOS likes NAND2 gates, so we say that's a size one, and then all other gates will size that, we'll see what their size is according uh, to their, ref uh, their relative size to such a NAND2 gate. Um, when we discuss the number of instances, we're talking about the number of things placed, and that's much smaller than the number of gates because there are gates that are um, big, and so uh, there are very few instances, uh, there's only a couple of instances for uh, number of NAND2 gates. And same thing with uh, macros. So if we take a, an SRAM macro, it may be several thousand or even more than that um, NAND2 gates. So just as a rule of thumb, um, depends on your design, of course, but you can say that the number of instances is about the number of gates divided by four or five. And remember, uh, the complexity of our algorithm actually has to deal with the number of instances. And in fact, what we're going to be discussing today is with the number of standard cells and not the equivalent um, gate size of our design. So now I'll start discussing what our um, central issue for this lecture is, which is placement. So placement is the stage of the design flow during which each instance, or each standard cell, because hard macros we usually place by hand, is given an exact location. Our inputs to this stage are a net list of gates and wires that came out of our synthesis, and we have the floor plan and the technology constraints that came from our importing the design and drawing up the floor plan. The output of uh, this stage is that all cells are located in the floor plan. Each cell has some sort of a placement, and the goal of this is that each of these cells has a legal placement. Uh, a cell cannot sit in the middle of a row. It can't sit over here. It has to sit in between, uh, uh, right on a row, in fact, in a site in a certain um, legal location. Um, it can't be overlapped and so forth with other cells. Um, we need to do this while en enabling detailed routes. So in the end, we're going to uh, go and do place and route here in a little while. And we have to make sure that we're able to actually connect all of the um, uh, the, the, the pins and the nets that should be uh, that, that should make up the net list. So um, we'll see that our placement stage has to enable this. It's very important. Um, and as a third 
goal we want to meet the SDCs that we set the timing area and power targets of our design so those are the three goal main goals of the placement stage how does the flow go um, most tool like almost every stage that we've done so far use two or even more stages they start with some sort of global or rough type of stage in this case it's global placement what we'll do is we'll divide our um, our design into different bins um, bins sometimes they call them global cells or something like that and we'll try to minimize the number of connections between the group so we want to have uh, to make sure that uh, for congestion reasons we don't have too many connections between the groups but we're going to decide where each and every cell is going to fit in a, in a very rough way then we'll go into detail placement where we'll take these cells and kind of uh, shuffle them around a bit until they actually sit in legal locations with no overlaps and so forth and then we may put all kinds of uh, different optimizations to try and minimize the wire length or other cost metrics so uh, when we finish our design we want to have uh, an uncongested design so we'll be able to route it and here we're taking a very old channel routing based type of a picture but this is just a picture I found somewhere and um, what you can see here is you have uh, these standard cell rows and you have the routing between them is very nice there aren't many crossovers these are flight lines that just show which pin has to connect to which pin this will probably be routable pretty easily on the other hand we could have done the same thing and just by mixing up the places of uh, of these cells in each row we could have had all these crisscrosses and there's not much of a chance that we'll be able to route such a design so that's a bad placement So to start, we'll look at a random placement algorithm. And again, I want to thank Rob Rutenbar, whose course really taught me all this stuff. And it, it has a much better, um, much more detailed overview of all of this. So let's look at the problem formulation. Given a net list and fixed shape cells, which will be small standard cells, we want to find the exact location of the cells to minimize the area and wire length. This will be consistent with the standard cell design methodology that we um, discussed in detail uh, several lectures ago. It'll be row based. Right now we're going to take out hard macros from the, the solution just to make things easier. Um, we'll have our modules. They'll usually be fixed equal height. Um, we may have some double height cells, but that doesn't matter right now. We have some fixed places. These are either IO pads or, or the pins of our macro, and they'll be connected by edges or hyper edges. Um, the objectives of our placement, is uh, there are two objectives mainly. These are um, to minimize the cost components. And the cost components, um, there'll be area, but the area is actually given by the floor plan. So it's mainly to minimize the wire length. So if we take all the gates and we see all the connections between them, and these may be with flight lines or with uh, uh, assuming some sort of a uh, Manhattan type of uh, wiring uh, solution. So we want to add up all these wire lengths and we want to try to minimize the size of them. Um, there are additional cost components, which will be timing. Obviously, we put in our SDC some sort of timing constraint, and congestion is one of the important ones that we'll discuss. So congestion could be, let's take a, um, uh, a cut here through the floor plan at any given place, and we'll count the number of nets that go through it, and that's uh, the, we want to minimize the number of nets that go through any cut, either horizontal or vertical, in our uh, floor plan. So um, we're going to start by building a very simple placer, in fact, a trivial placer, not necessarily a good one, but let's just start with this as a basic um, way to go about our algorithm. So we uh, will assume a very simple chip model. We'll have a grid of different locations called 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, on the x-axis and by the y-axis, and we'll assume that each of our cells can go into one of these grid places. Um, and for our pins, we'll put them at um, set places, uh, at fixed places on the edges. We'll assume a simple gate model, so all of the cells have the same size. They can fit inside exactly one of these grid points. In reality, of course, the cells are of different widths of the same height, usually with uh, our site definition. But uh, we will assume that uh, our cells can just go and fit inside one cell inside each grid position. Um, we need a cost metric and our basic cost metric again looking at our previous slide is that we want to minimize the wire length okay so we need to um, define what our cost metric is and we'll we'll use a, a metric called the half perimeter wire length or HPWL this is just one metric it's not uh, the it may not be the best metric it is for sure not the only metric but let's just use this as a as a first way to to do things so how do we use the half perimeter wire length we look at our cells and we put a bounding box 
that um, contains every single cell that's on that net and we look at the half perimeter of this bounding box so the half perimeter is basically taking the difference in the x-axis plus the difference in the y-axis or it's as exactly as taking the perimeter and dividing it by two that's why it's half perimeter wire length so in this case um, this cell is set at 3 1 so th uh, the x the delta x is 3 minus 1 equals 2 and the uh, this one is placed at 1 4 so 4 minus 1 is 3 and we get a half perimeter wire length of 2 plus 3 which equals 5 now why is that good? Um, as we see, it kind of tells us what the two-point net probably looks like when we're assuming this type of Manhattan routing where we can only route vertically and horizontally. But how does it deal with a larger net? So let's say we have a four-point net. Where, uh, so this gate has a fan out of three, and it's driving this cell, this cell, and this cell. Well, why is this half perimeter wire length a kind of a good estimator? Um, because we don't have to separately route each one of these nets and count all the half perimeters of each one of these nets. Um, in fact, because this is uh, this is um, uh, connections that are shorted together, we can usually just branch off by touching any part of our net and going to the next uh, cell. So using the half perimeter wire length, we, we bound all of these cells and it gives a much more um, realistic kind of a estimation of how much each additional net adds to the wire length because this cell doesn't add much to our general wire length. So in this case, we get four, uh, we get uh, on the y axis five minus, um, minus uh, one, and on the x axis, we get four minus one, and uh, an altogether half perimeter wire length of seven. So now that we have our cost metric and our definition of our model, we can uh, define a simple algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something really, well, not very naive. We're going to just randomly place each uh, gate. So we're going to start here, and this is kind of a pseudocode for our, our design. For each gate, which is called GI in our net list, let's place GI in some random XY um, location that is not preoccupied by a, a previous iteration of our of our for each loop okay and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the half perimeter wire length we're gonna start at zero and then go over every single net in the net list and add to our total wire length we're gonna add the half perimeter wire length of that net so then we're gonna apply what's called random iterative improvement you can also call it hill climbing okay we're gonna pick a random uh, pair of gates so um, we're going to just pick two gates, GI and GJ, just any random pair. We're going to swap between them. We're going to change their locations. We're going to re, uh, and then we're going to recalculate our um, our uh, our wire length. So if the difference in our wire length, the new half perimeter wire length minus the old perimeter wire length, if it got smaller, then we're going to accept the swap. If not, we're going to undo the swap and go to the next iteration of our random uh, selection and we're going to repeat this um, while the total half perimeter wire length is improving once it stops improving it's saturated we're going to stop that's a very simple placer and was it any good well we can see um, this type of a graph that uh, rob rutenbar provided that you have uh, the total wire length and if you start over here and you start doing all these millions of swaps and you see that the numbers are millions we go down pretty quickly we, we get pretty quickly we get a, an improvement but at some point it saturates and it saturates at a pretty high level we didn't get too low in this so um, uh, it is good but it's not really good and the reason is that we get stuck in a local minima so what we're doing again we're doing what's called hill climbing or hill descending we're starting at some sort of a place in a um, n, in an n dimensional uh, um, area here and we start going we always go down we always go down towards whatever minimum we're uh, around and we finally get stuck in some sort of a valley um, and that's a local minimum in this three-dimensional uh, space that we can see so that is a problem. Uh, we want to get over to some sort of a maximum local, a uh, maximum minimum um, uh, of the whole design and optimal point. We're probably not going to be able to do that on such a wide dimensional space. But what we can do to try and do that is we can uh, think about jumping over some hills. Why don't we go up? Uh, why don't we go uphill and go to a worse solution sometimes? Maybe that'll provide us with the ability to get down here. So that brings us to the idea of simulated annealing. Simulated annealing is an attempt by us to copy 
some physical traits and put it into a type of a algorithm that may help us improve. So um, annealing is something we discussed when we discussed semiconductors and, uh, and different process steps. And uh, we just have to remember that the lowest energy state of a crystal lattice is when all atoms are lined up. So if we have a messy crystal, kind of like this with all these atoms um, scattered around and not in a nice pretty crystal, what we can do is we can heat up the crystal. That gives each of these atoms a lot of uh, energy. And then they can move around and try to find a better state where the crystal has lower energy. But while we cool um, this thing, the uh, atoms lose energy and then they can only move very close to each other. So they can um, improve their state a little bit by moving to, to close around places, but they can't go very far. Um, this is the idea that we take to, uh, to our simulated annealing algorithm, to our uh, random iterative uh, placement or random hill climbing and what we do is we take the probability of a move that uh, comes from physics where the probability is e to the power of, uh, of minus the change in energy divided by kt and um, the, the higher the energy is the um, higher the probability is that we will take a move the lower the energy is the colder the, the temperature is the lower um, the probability we take a move is so we make fewer big jumps um, this is the idea of simulated annealing. Let's see. Uh, let's see it in uh, the algorithm that does it, and then let's see how it works. Okay, so we'll start with the same basic algorithm. We do a random initial placement. We swap two random gates. We evaluate the change in half perimeter wire length, and if the wire length improves, we accept the change. So this is what we're doing over here in this part of the algorithm. But the question is, what happens if the wire length increases? So if delta L is smaller than zero, then we keep the swap. But if not, what do we do? We evaluate the annealing probability function. So instead of delta E, the change in energy before, we look at the delta L, the change in wire length. And we have this parameter T, which is the um, simulated temperature. It's not real temperature, but it's some sort of simulated temperature. So we take this P as E to the power of minus delta L over T. And then we choose a, random un a uniform random number R that's between 0 and 1. And we evaluate if R is smaller than P, if um, the random number is smaller than this p value, then we keep the swap. Um, if not, then we get rid of the swap. And the question is, what is t? And as I said, t is this type of a simulated temperature. So it's, uh, it starts hot and it cools down. That means that there is a much higher probability at the beginning of our algorithm that r will be smaller than p uh, because p will be larger. But as we cool down, as we take a cooler temperature, p will be smaller. So the chance that r is bigger than p goes under the, uh, goes lower. So as we see here, what we do uh, if uh, is that after a certain number of swaps, we go and we um, change t, we make t colder. Um, when, once we stop getting any improvement, we go to this frozen state and then we go out of our while loop. So what we do is at each temperature, we take a certain number, a large number of simulations. We uh, do the simulations. Sometimes we take them, sometimes we don't. Then we um, uh, decrease our temperature. Um, we do again another number of simulations and so forth and so on. So let's see. Does this work? Hmm. Well, yes, it works really well. We can see here that uh, as we take our temperature from high to low, we're going this way, we're going uh, to the left in this case, we start with a, a high wire length, and this is for a 10 by 10 lattice, a 10 by 10 grid with a thousand moves per temperature. What we do is we start going down until we get a real low, uh, low wire length. Um, we can see that it works at a much bigger lattice too. So we have 100 by 100 lattice and here we have 250,000 moves per temperature and we get something here that's very interesting. It's called an S curve. You see this S? We always get this S. At first it takes a long time to start really improving and the reason for that is that we, with a high temperature we take a lot of these big moves. But then quickly we start improving with a, um, with a regular hill climbing. Uh, we start going downhill towards a local minimum and then finally we get stuck kind of in our local minimum because uh, we can't take very big jumps. The probability of taking a jump is, is really low. So many EDA algorithms use simulated annealing. The question is, does it find an optimal solution? And the, the answer is, of course, no. It does not find an optimal solution. This is a complete heuristic based on a random uh, type of a process. But it is really good at avoiding local minima and getting out of them. So what happens if I run it again? Of course, I'll get a different answer each time because it's random um, when we actually take a uh, move or we get rid of it. And it's random where we start and what kind of area in our design space we get stuck at. But 
I just want to mention this is not how placers work today, and that will do in a moment after we go into today's Chip Hall of Fame. So the chip we're going to be discussing today is um, Deep Blue. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that's really relevant for today because artificial intelligence is becoming a larger part of our lives. And one of the guys uh, that started this was uh, Deep Blue that a lot of people know. Uh, it was a pretty big thing in pop culture because this was the first computer to actually beat a reigning chess uh, chess champion and here we have Gary Kasparov playing against this guy who was just doing the moves that Deep Blue uh, told him to do. The first time it won a whole tournament was in May 1997. Um, there were 1.5 million transistors on the main chip there uh, providing 11.38 giga floating point operations per second. It could make 200 million chess moves per second and Kasparov said the moves were uncomputer like and that they exerted great psychological pre pressures on him as a chess player. So um, Deep Blue was inducted into the IEEE Chip Hall of Fame in 2017, and we just wanted to commemorate it. So now we'll go over to the next chapter of our talk about analytic placement. And again, this section is heavily based on Rob Brutenbars from Logic to Layout. So here's the analytic lay uh, placement approach. Um, we start with the question, can we write an equation that the minimum of the equation is the placement or the optimal placement of the algorithm? Let's make take this down a step and say if we have a cost function such, such as wire length as we looked at before, and the cost function is a, 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 is a function of the gate coordinates. So for each gate we have a coordinate x, i, y, i, and then we can, um, we can describe the total wire length uh, uh, as some sort of function of all the x's and all the y's of all of our gates. If we had that, then we could just um, find the minimum of f, and this would be our optimal placement. That's a, a tough thing. Um, it kind of sounds crazy, but yes, we can do it. Um, all the modern placers uh, nowadays are based on analytic placement. And uh, the way to do it is we write the cost function in a what we call a mathematically friendly way. So we'll change our cost function so it will um, adhere to this type of an approach. And then we can just d differentiate by x and by y, um, equate to zero, and we'll find the minimum of the entire equation. So let's rewrite our cost function um, to make this uh, mathematically friendly, as I call it. And we'll use a, a cost function called quadratic wire. So the quadratic li wire length is basically um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the line here, the distance between two points or the distance squared. So uh, we take the points and we say um, x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus my, m y2 squared. So if we look at this gate, um, it's uh, at 1, 4, and this gate is at 3, 1. So what we would do is take the difference in x's, so 3 minus 1 squared, and uh, add that to 4 minus 1 squared, and we get a um, total quadratic wire length of 13. Okay, so this just is a kind of a, a, a definition of the, again, the, the distance between two points squared, but this is a two-point net, and that's a simple representation, and that sounds like an okay thing to describe the wire length, but what happens when we have more than two points in it? So if we have a k point net with k being larger than two, for example, this gate here that has a fan out of three, uh, giving us a total of four um, nets. And beforehand with the half perimeter wire length, we just put a bounding box around it and it kind of showed this ability to connect the different nets, but we can't really do that in this case. I mean, what, what distance do we take in this type of a thing? So what we'll do in this approach is we'll make um, what we call a fully connected clique model. So a fully connected clique model means that we'll break up this net that has uh, the mini, the, the, the high fan out into mini nets with point-to-point uh, -point nets. So each of these gates now connects to each of the other gates in, uh, in the fully connected clique model and that gives us quite a few nets um, in, uh, but each of these nets we can um, calculate the distance between um, the two gates that are connected on the net. Okay, the problem is that we get a, a total of k times k minus 1 divided by two nets. That, that makes a much uh, larger, that makes a very large effect for having a high fan out on our net. And it's probably not a true effect. So what we'll want to do is we're going to weight this, weight each net, make each weight be worth um, less than it was before. And we'll take as our weighting factor this um, just a, a, a 1 divided by k minus 1. So um, for example, in our in our example here, our k is four because there are four nets. So one divided by k minus one is a third, right? 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take each one of these things, like for example, here we have um, 4 minus 1 plus, uh, plus 5 minus 4, um, each of those squared, we're going to uh, multiply that by a third. So a third times 4 minus 1 plus 5 minus 4 squared, and we're going to do that for each and every single one of these nets, and we'll get a total sum of the six weighted two-point lengths. Okay, so the, this weighting factor, it reduces the effect of each additional um, uh, fan out or each additional um, net in the clique model on the total wire length. Um, uh, there's one last point here that each of these gates are dimensionless. This will be important for us uh, uh, later on. And I want to mention something else. Uh, we're going to show you how analytic placement gives us an optimal solution. But um, remember that there is uh, almost no such thing as optimal in the world of algorithms. And here, too, we have different things that are heuristic or that come in and, and remove the optimality. So one of them is this um, cost function. Is the quadratic wire length cost, fu uh, cost function the real thing we want to optimize? And that's a good question. It, it's good enough. I mean, that's what's been shown in research over the years. But it, it probably is not the most optimal thing for every type of system or every type of uh, chip we want to make. Um, another thing is this weighting factor. Is the weighting factor of 1 divided by k minus 1 the right weighting factor? And that's a good question. Um, uh, there is no good an there is no true answer for it, but it has worked well enough in research. So now let's give you an example of how we do this calculation, just a, a numerical example to see how it's done. So we have in our model, we have our fixed pads. So there's one pad at 0, 0, and one pad at 1, 0 0.5. And we have um, two gates uh, that are somewhere. Um, this one is x1, y1, okay, and this one is uh, x2, y2. That's the location. The location is a parameter, and we're going to find what our optimal location is for it. And um, we also see that the, the each of the nets uh, uh, has a, some sort of a weighting. So like the weighting before was just a third on all of them, but uh, we just wrote here for the example different weights. So this uh, net between the pad and uh, and pin number one and uh, gate number one has a weighting factor of one, but the net connecting gate number one and two has a weighting factor of two. So how are we going to um, uh, calculate the coordinates, these x i y i coordinates? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to use our qu quadratic wire length, and we're going to see here. Okay, so if we take uh, the net between these two guys, it's just x2 minus x1 times the weighting factor, uh, squared times the weighting factor, plus um, y2 minus y1 times uh, squared times the weighting factor. So that was uh, simple enough. Um, we can also do the same, we must also do the same thing for the nets uh, that are connected to pads or pins. And these pads, they have a constant uh, placement. So uh, for the um, for the for this one here, what we're going to do is we're going to take x2 minus 1 squared times the weighting factor, which is 4, and y2 minus, y, uh, mi minus 0.5 squared times 4. So that gives us this. And the same, same thing we'll do over here. We'll take um, x1 minus 0 squared times 1 and y1 minus 0 squared times 1 and we'll get to that as well okay um, so there's some important things that we want to pay attention to in in the quadratic wire length so this plus this plus this is going to give us our um, quadratic uh, wire length right and uh, and what we can see here is a few things if we take these guys over here they have all the x i's in them and if we take these guys over here, they have the y i's in them. But there are no um, expressions here that have both x, y, and y i. And that's really good because that enables us to separate this part of the equation and this part of uh, this part of the sum and this part of the sum and separately differentiate them to find the optimal. Okay, and that's why we are actually using this quadratic wire length type of an expression. Okay, so now we are going to use our basic calculus. What we're going to do is we're going to say what's the quadratic wire length uh, of the x part of this equation, what's the quadratic wire length of the y part of the expression, um, and we just write the sum of this. So this is q of x and this is q of y, and uh, when we write when we write that down, we're gonna um, do a partial um, differentiation by x1 and by x2 by each of the gates. Um, compared to zero and that provides us with a with a with a linear equation so we have this matrix here 6 minus 4 minus 4 12 times the vector x1 x2 and that gives us a solution of 0 and 8 
the same exact thing we're going to do on the y um, on the y part of the equation and f we can uh, easily solve these two linear linear sets and we get um, a some numbers for x1 and x2 and y1 and y2 okay so just to look at this solution that we did as we saw before we found that the coordinates of our gates are x1 y1 and x2 y2 that was what we solved and we can see a couple of things so first of all the placement that we got it really makes visual sense so when we just look at the model over here on the left we can assume that everything will have to be on a straight line because uh, this guy's pulling over here and this guy's pulling over there why shouldn't they sit on some sort of straight line with some sort of division between it and we see in the solution that in fact um, we do get a straight line here between another thing we see is that this guy is pulling strongly it's a, a big weight well this guy is pulling weakly and this is a bit stronger so we could assume that this will be the shortest type of a net well, this net will be a bit longer and this will be the longest. And we actually do see that here. There's a very short net over here, a bit longer net over here, and a, and a real long net over here. This is very similar to what we call spring weights. So if we had um, two uh, anchors on the wall, which are these uh, pads over here, and we had springs between them and their different strengths of the strings, which are the wire lengths, we'd get that the steady state of how the strings are pulled are very similar to this type of a thing. If we now would put a weight over here that was connected to, to this guy, I mean a, a pad over here that was connected to this guy, it would drive the whole thing up like that or so forth. And um, so this is the type of thing that we expected to think. This makes a visual sense. Uh, larger weights provide us with a shorter wire. That's very important to do type of a sanity check of what we get. Uh, a second observation is looking at the algebra of it. And there's something real interesting we see. You see this and this? Well, they're exactly the same. Okay, so actually for, for n gates for that we want to place, we get two equivalent n by n matrices, which are these matrices, and we'll call this matrix A. Okay, um, and then we get a linear system that's A x, where x is the, uh, the, the um, vector of the x uh, coordinates here, and similar A y, we get uh, the, the y coordinates here, gives us some sort of an output vector of B x, and b y okay so that's our linear matrix and uh, we found that a is this and b and x and b y are that and uh, just what are these b things that's the only thing that we we have to think about and b um, these guys are driven by where our actual uh, pads are so there, there there's some there's some representation of the pad coordinates okay so that was very cool because now we have a uh, real way of, um, of analytically optimizing the placement of a, some sort of a, a set. So let's look at a recipe for success of how to do this. Um, something that uh, I'm going to add here but we didn't observe before is that A is actually a, a, some sort of a, a modification of what we call the connectivity matrix. The connectivity matrix, or C because for connectivity, is um, some sort of a matrix that discusses or tells us about what the connectivity between the gates and the pads in our network are. So um, the recipe is like this. For C uh, uh, at position IJ, it's going to be equal to CJI. So we have a symmetrical matrix. And the uh, value in these two places is going to be W for a net width weight W. Okay, so CIJ equals CJI. Um, for net IJ, um, it's going to be the weight between uh, the two um, gates I and J. Okay. Um, on all other places, we're going to have zero. So both on the um, on the diagonal and on anywhere where there's no net, if we have gate one and gate two and there's no net between them, we're going to put a zero at, uh, po at position one, two, and two, one in our matrix. We'll see that in a second with a, with a numerical example. Okay, um, so that's this the connectivity matrix. It th basically tells us what the weights are between every pair of gates. Um, so then we can just take our C matrix. What we're going to do is for each um, number we have in the matrix, we're going to put a negative in the A matrix. So negative Cij is going to be uh, Aij. Then we're going to look at the diagonals. So Aii, the diagonal, is just the sum of the row i plus the weight of the net i to the pad if there exists such a net. Okay, so that's what it says over here. Um, if i is not equal to j, if we're not on the diagonal, we're going to take minus cij, minus the uh, connectivity matrix value. If we are on the diagonal, what we're going to do is we're going to sum up 
the values of the connectivity matrix and add to it the weight um, to a pad if there's a pad there. For B vectors, again, we said B is some sort of representation of a pad, and the way we're going to get them is that we're going to, um, for uh, Bx, for the X vector of B in the position I, what we're going to do is we're going to take the weight of the um, connection between uh, the uh, pad and, 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 the, and that gate, and gate I, times the, the X position of the, uh, of the pad. Okay, and for weight and for the the y vector, the y pad vector, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply again this weight times the y position. If there is no um, connection between them, obviously the uh, b x i and b y i are both going to be zero. Okay, so that may have been kind of hard to 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 perceive in our uh, heads without seeing an example. So let's see an example of that using five gates. So we're given. Um, a five gate example there are four pads scattered around uh, and they have some sort of a constant position and then we have one two three uh wait, wait a second one two three four five gates you see i numbered them one two three four and five and then we have different weight waiting um waiting uh, weights around here these blue things so um if we kind of guess what we expect we have this large weight here this 10 and a large weight here so i imagine that this pad is going to pull gates number one and three really tightly over uh, close to it. The rest are going to be kind of scattered around uh, a bit more evenly towards the different anchor points we have in the example. But let's do this. Uh, it's really hard to actually guess what the placement is going to be here. So let's try to do our analytic placement. So first we build our connectivity matrix. So for our connectivity matrix, remember what we do is we take our matrix and in position one, two, and two, one, we put the weight between gate one and gate two, which will be a one. In uh, position in uh, one three and three one, we're also we're gonna have with the weight ten. In position three four and four three, we're gonna have the weight one. In position um, two four, we're gonna have the weight one. And four two, we're gonna have the weight one. Four five and uh, two five. Okay, so that builds our connectivity matrix. So let's just take an example. We have uh, position one three or three one, sorry, and one three. Um, there are 10 and we look between gates 1 and 3 there are 10 that's what we said and the diagonal is going to be all zeros so that's our connectivity matrix now remember the way to take our uh, connectivity matrix and make up our a matrix is to take all of these numbers and just add a minus to them so that's going to be everything off diagonal and then we just have the question of how to figure out the diagonals of this connectivity matrix and what we said is we're going to sum up the row so the sum of this is 10 plus 1, that's 11. And then look um, for uh, gate number 1, because this is row 1, we're going to see what kind of connections it has to pads. And we see that there's a connection here um, that, is, uh, that is worth 10. So we're going to add 10 to that. So we're going to get 21 in the first position of the diagonal. And you can see that here, we get 21. Let's do the second row. So we sum up row 2, and we have 4 over here and we look at gate 2 and gate 2 has no connections to any of the pads so therefore plus 0 so we just get a 4 over here again uh, take the example of gate of gate 3 so gate 3 we have 10 1 1 that's 12 plus 3 connects over here to the pad uh, uh, along here which with 1 so we get 12 plus 1 that's 13 etc etc we'll get the whole um, a matrix. So now that we have the A matrix, we want to uh, figure out what the B matrix, uh, the B vectors are. And as we said for the B vectors, for ve uh, for B X in the position one uh, and B Y in the position one, we're going to take gate one and check um, what the connections are to uh, pads. And we see that there's a connection to this pad over here. The coordinates of this pad are zero and one. So we're going to take the weight ten multiply it by zero that's what's going to be in the x vector so we're going to have zero in the x vector for the y we're going to multiply it by one so we're going to have 10 in the y uh, vector so for uh, b x in the position um, one we're going to have zero and b y in the position one we're going to have 10. okay um, similarly for the second gate what we have is no connections so therefore um, b x in position two is going to be zero and by in the position two is going to be zero for the third gate we have this connection here which is one 
and so we're going to have 1 times 1 is 1, and 1 times 0 is 0, so we're going to have 1 and 0. Um, for the fourth gate, for example, um, we have 1 times 1 is 1, and 1 times 1 is 1, we're going to have 1, 1, etc. So we're going to build our vectors, let's see, just for the, the last, um, the fifth position, right? So 5 times 0.5, uh, uh, 5, uh, I mean, 1 times 0.5 is 0.5 and 1 times 0 is 0, and we get the fifth position in the b vector. So we were able to easily build that, and now all we have to do is solve this linear, um, linear system, and we get a placement of our uh, uh, final placement, which shows that as we guessed, uh, gate number 1 and gate number 3 are going to be pulled tightly over to the pad over here in the corner, and the rest are going to kind of be scattered by being pulled to uh, the other uh, pads, but uh, they're pulled a lot less strongly because of these uh, this 1 versus 10 weighting factor. Okay, so we saw an example of uh, analytical placing, and we said that this is going to give us an optimal solution to our problem, which should solve all the problems in life. However, as we said, there are two places that we kind of uh, put some uh, non-idealities in. One was the, the basic cost metric of this quadratic placement. Uh, quadratic wire length is that correct um and we don't have a clear answer to that but maybe it's good enough and the second one was the weighting factor that we put on all of our um, clique model okay so uh that's not the only problem the biggest problem probably is what we call gate clustering so when we take a quadratic placement and see what it looks like um, we see something usually like this so um, here's a, an example that Rob Rutenbarg gave, and you see that um, what happened when we applied quadratic placement, everything wanted to be in the middle, and that is probably not good. We would expect uh, that we want to pretty much have a good utilization of our floor plan and scatter things around, and that, that, that's probably not exactly what we wanted, and it came out of the fact that our um, we had no um, actual... Uh, uh, incentive to, to put things each in their own place and everything was uh, just a point in the, in, the, in, the, in the design space. Okay, uh, this gets even worse when we start having macros scattered around. So we have all kinds of SRAMs and different types of macros scattered around our floor plan. And now um, look how uh, this example of 211,000 gates with 500 or more hard macros that IBM gave. And you see uh, it just wants to put all the gates on top of the macros and it has no um, and no knowledge of uh, this blockage type of stuff being there. So this is really a problem, and how do we solve it? Well, the way we do it with everything in uh, the EDA world, it seems like, is we use recursion. And this time we'll use what we call recursive partitioning, where our goal is actually to take uh, our solution here and scatter all the gates so they give us a good solution, but they use utilize the entire area. Okay. So if we start with our first quadratic placement where we have this scattering, what we're going to do is we're going to cut our um, solution in two and then um, send all the uh, ones that fell here on the left to the left side, send all the ones here on the right side, and we create two new problems. We have this floor plan and this floor plan. Okay, we're going to solve that. We again get this clustering in the middle, but what are we going to do? We're going to cut this type of a floor plan in two and um, we're going to get, uh, uh, again, uh, four different solutions here that we can see. They're again going to be clustered. So what do we do? We keep on partitioning them, keep on getting smaller and smaller problems until we have small enough problems that we can do some sort of a um, solution on, our, on a much smaller uh, basis. Okay, what this essentially did is it scattered all of our gates. So we see that the gates now are scattered all around our floor plan, utilizing it much better than in the situation over here where everything was stuck right in the middle on top of each other. So let's uh, uh, describe this recursive partitioning more formally. We're going to start with a stage called partitioning. We're going to divide our current solution into two. It can either be vertically or horizontally, depending on what our previous solution was. So we're going to divide it in half. After we divide it in half, we're going to assign gates into, this, into the new smaller regions. So how we're going to assign gates is we're going to take the, um, 
the other axis. So we cut here vertically. We're going to take the horizontal axis and we're going to sort all the gates according to the axis. And we're going to say, okay, this guy's the first one, this guy's the second one, third one, fourth one, etc. Until we get to half, we're going to say that half of the gates we're going to assign to the left side. So we took and we sorted and we found that all of these gates, these were the um, most left placed gates. We're going to say, okay, you guys should be inside this left partition and you guys even though you may have fell in our solution actually on the left side we're gonna throw you over into the right partition so you have to um, we're gonna assign you over here and then you will have to be inside this side okay so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna sort it and assign the gates to each of these partitions then we have to do what we call containment we have to formulate a new quadratic placement uh, matrix that actually keeps the gates in the new region how are we going to do that? That's kind of tricky. How are we going to make sure that this gate that wanted to be over here on the left side will fi find itself on the right side in the end? And the way to do that is what we call pseudopads. I mean, it solves a, a different problem as well. We have connectivity between these two pads, and now in our new solution, this, this guy's in this side and this guy's in this side. What do we do with this uh, connection, which should affect our placement? So what we're going to do is we're going to create these pseudopads. We're going to take this guy, we're going to say he wanted to be over here at this uh, y um, coordinate. So we're going to put him on the barrier over here as a pad that cannot be moved and solve uh, the solution for this. Uh, accordingly, we're going to take this guy, move him over here, put him here. And on this solution, we're going to assume that he was over there. Those are called pseudopads. They're not really there, but they show that um, uh, there is still this connectivity and the weight, the weighting factor between the pads uh, still exists and still uh, affects the solution. But it also makes sure that uh, this guy stays on this side and these guys stay on this side because they have a connection to a, a pad which is on the boundary. There's nothing in negative territory or whatever it could be called. Um, Again, this is another kind of a non-ideality of the solution because pseudopads are not exactly the real connectivity that we would we should be taking into consideration between them, but they're pretty close. So let's take an example of how to do recursive partitioning. Okay, so we start with an initial net list. We have five gates. We numbered them one, two, three, four, and five. We have nine wires that connect between the gates. They all have weights. And we have these three pads that are called A, B, and C. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a quadratic placement and we get this nice placement, but it's clustered and it's not good enough. So what we have to do now is we have to cut the um, floor plan in half with this blue line over here. And now um, we have to sort on the x axis. So we see that one, five and four are the most left uh, pointing guys, uh, the, the ones that are uh, placed on the most left hand side of the partition and three and two are uh, the most right hand side. So we're going to actually go and say that um, uh, we have to make three and two um, appear in in the solution to this matrix while we can solve our quadratic placement for this guy. But as we see, we have a kind of a problem because four is connected to three, um, five is connected to two, one is connected to two, and in our next solution, um, three and two are not gonna be part of the solution. So what do we do? We um, make our new, we make these pseudopads. So three was over here in our initial solution. We make a pseudopad at the same uh, y axis, but on the x boundary, and two was over here. We make a pseudopad that is on the same uh, y p positioning of two, but on the, uh, the new boundary. Okay, now we can solve um, this left hand side and we get this nice uh, quadratic uh, placement uh, solution with these pseudopads. The pseudopads we can now uh, erase, but we, we know that in the end we'll have this connection between five and two and between four and three. Okay, now we take, um, uh, we basically have our uh, solution and we can go over to the other side. So on the other side, again, we have two and three that they, we have to contain them over here while um, they have connections to one, five, and four. So we will again propagate these guys over to the boundary and create pseudopads that two and three are connected to. Um, uh, and this is the input to the third quadratic placement. And now we can solve it and we get the placement of two and three. And we can uh, continue doing this until we have small enough areas that we've scattered the cells enough and we can make a local solution. So we keep on recursive partitioning until we have something like 10 to 100 gates. That's kind of a, a number that we can say that uh, we can deal with. And now we have um, these placements that are not legal because we have overlaps. And again, 
we have uh, things that are not sitting in the exact rows and so forth so how do we solve it we have to uh, we have to do um, some sort of a legalization step um, to uh, actually move our gates that are not points there they actually have sizes according to our left files we have to move them into rows so they're legal how do we do legalization we can do it with simulated annealing for example we can just use a real low temperature so the gates won't jump around too far um, but finally they'll get to a, uh, a legal position or we can do other types of things so that was how we do analytic placement and that's how um, basically our placers work today so having discussed uh, the placement algorithms let's go over to see how placement is done in practice in the back-end tools so in addition to wire length minimization, placement can be driven by two additional primary targets. So over here, we see that uh, the area, wire length, and overlap are the traditional place, uh, methods of placement. But we ha can't forget timing optimization or timing-driven placement, which is uh, something that we need to meet the SDC constraints, right? And the second one is congestion minimization. So we have to remember that one of the goals of placement is to allow our um, whole design to be routed in the end. So uh, there are other things such as uh, clock tree and power minimization, but uh, we're not going to be discussing it uh, too much. So we have to take clock gating into consideration. And if we're doing all kinds of uh, uh, multi-voltage and multi-supply placement, we have to take those into consideration. So just going a sh for a tiny bit over the, the, the two additional targets we discussed, timing driven placement. So um, that tries to place critical path cells close together to reduce the net RCs and to meet setup timing. So what we do is we do these things called virtual routes, where we're actually going and connecting uh, routes between the, the different places, but without actually going up in vias and changing layers and taking the layers into consideration. We just try to place the cells along timing critical paths close together to reduce the net RCs and to meet setup timing. Um, the net R RCs are based on virtual route estimates. This differentiates, for example, from uh, our previous uh, um, assumption where in synthesis we had these uh, type of wire load models that just took the net fan out and put in resistance and capacitance. So we already said that there is topographical synthesis or uh, physical aware synthesis, which does placement. And once we do placement, we can do this type of a trial route that just puts these um, single net, uh, single layer routings between the cells and can get a good assumption of what the RCs on the nets are. So that's a type of a thing that's done in placement. And again, nowadays it's already driven back into the synthesis tool in this physical aware or topographical synthesis. Um, the second uh, thing is congestion. So congestion occurs when the number of required routing tracks exceeds the number of available tracks. So if we have these types of global bins, which are areas where we'll have uh, lots of standard cells, maybe 100 or something like that, and we have edges of the bins, we know that um, a bunch of standard cells here want to go and connect to a bunch of standard cells that are in this type of a bin. So what we can see here is there's an area over here where let's say um, we can see that there are three routes that want to go um, over to this area. Uh, so the routing demand is three, but the routing supply maybe is only one. And then we have this overflow of three minus one equals two. So there would be an overflow of two in this area, and that is a high congestion area. Um, so overflow on each edge is defined as the routing demand minus the routing supply, of course, if that is, uh, if uh, the routing, if um, there is no overflow, then we get zero. So if um, the routing supply is larger than the routing demand, the overflow is zero. And the total overflow is the sum of the overflow over all edges. Um, usually the, the tool will show us, and we'll see in on the next slide, uh, some examples of this maybe, or the slide after that. Um, but it'll show us for each direction here. So routing on the, in the global, if we have this global cell over here, um, routing in the horizontal direction, we have a demand of 39, but only a supply of 35. So there's an overflow of four, or over here we have an overflow of one, uh, or here five, and here we have no overflow. Okay, so that's the type of a thing. And if we see these large overflow areas, that's really bad. So issues with congestion is that uh, are, are like this. Let's say that there's a bit of, of congestion over there and we need to take a route 
and route it from this side to this side, um, what we can do is we can make a detour. So we can go around this area, not go through this high congestion area, and we'll be able to route our design and finish without any DRCs. The problem is that the RC delay of this type of a, a long route is much higher than a type of a route that just goes point to point. And that means um, that our, our RC estimates will be wrong, our virtual routing estimates will be wrong, and we'll um, get delay, delays that are optimistic. Okay, um, the bigger problem is when we have these severely congested design, like as you can see here, this is probably a really bad routing hotspot. It's a high congested area, and we won't be able to route this, and we'll need to fix it. Usually the tools have uh, some sort of thing as, such as a congestion map. This would be some sort of a color map. Sometimes it comes in type of an ASCII style or just a, a, um, a summary of how many areas of congestion over this and this amount are. But um, in, in the cadence tools, we get these types of little um, uh, di uh, diamonds that show us the uh, V158 over 150. That means there's a, an overflow of eight in this area and uh, in the vertical direction so going up and down and if we have a lot of these red dots after um, trial route following placement then uh, we should go back and try and fix it so congestion driven placement uh, tries to do this congestion reduction it tries to evaluate the congestion hotspots and spread the the cells in the area to reduce congestion here's an example this again is an example taken with the type of a routing channel that was used a couple decades ago um, so we have uh, cells a b c and d uh, e f g and h and we have the connection between them and let's say we had only a, a small amount of uh, tracks that could actually go horizontally but we need to route three tracks over here so this is an unroutable layout we have uh, some congestion that's uh, unroutable over there what we the, what the tool could do it could just change the placement here so um, D was moved over to here and a was moved over to here and you see it solved all of our problems we're able to route this because there's only two horizontal routes in each area <coughs> So what are our strategies to fix congestion? Well, basically, you got to go back to the floor plan and modify it. That's uh, the main strategy to fix the congestion. One thing is to go and put in different regions. So we can say if we have a, a routing hotspot over here in this area, we have a lot of congestion. We can go and mark it as a partial blockage area, put some sort of a low utilization in this area. If we have lower utilization, there'll be less routing here, and maybe that'll solve, solve our routing problems. Um, Ports. Ports are very important. Um, these can be either due to our pad placements or just if we're doing a hierarchical design, just where we put our actual pins. Um, we can change the ports to a different layer. We can spread them out. We can reorder them, move them to different sides. So moving our ports around on the sides and thinking about where they are may help us fix congestion, getting our ports closer to the actual macro where the actual macros will be placed and so forth. Macro location orientation. So again, um, our placement will be driven by macros. Remember that both the ports and the macros, they're kind of the anchors that um, are fixed before uh, running our placement algorithm. And they are the, the, the those anchors that are causing our springs to be loaded and, and pull the, the, the placement areas close to them. So just changing the macro location or orientation can um, really affect our congestion. Um, in, including things such as aligning the bus signal pins, increasing the spacing between macros, adding blockages and halos, and just decide, making sure that the uh, all the macros that talk to the same block are in the same area and so forth. So the core aspect ratio and size is another thing. Um, if we have uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, horizontal routing, then we can make our core aspect ratio taller. We can, uh, if we have a lot of, we can make it like this. We'll have more horizontal tracks. If on the other hand we have vertical uh, problems, we can make it like this. We'll have more vertical tracks if we can resize our floor plan. Um, we can also just increase our block size. Of course, we can do that. Sometimes uh, this will not help because if um, we have uh, a large uh, floor plan, sometimes the tool will cluster things in a certain area and we may have congestion in the middle. So we may have to do things such as this partial blockages and, and so forth. Um, and then another thing is uh, the power grid. So often we use, uh, as we said before, in the, the floor planning lecture that we have a trade-off of how well we distribute power versus how much routing we use up um, and again this is a, a strong trade-off we would like to give as much power as possible but then again this uh, causes us to have fewer tracks that are available for signal routing so we can um, 
take away uh, power uh, power stripes and even cut them in certain areas. Uh, but this will, of course, have an effect on how our IR drop in our uh, and so forth uh, arrives at each cell. So finally, just uh, looking at the Cadence tool, Anovus, how we do placement. So in the traditional flow, placement was achieved in two steps. What we would first do would be a uh, placement. Um, it would be set DB, place global congestion effort high. That type of a, a command would say we want to use this congestion driven placement. There are going to be a lot of these DB things that um, we can set before placement and before any other step of the design. And then we'd use this place design command, which would do a non timing, well, or at least a, a, it may be a timing driven, but lightly timing driven and lightly congestion driven placement that would go and try to. Um, uh, solve our placement problem our placement problem but without any optimization um, this includes a global placement and then a detailed placement step but in general that was the the flow that was used um, afterwards we would usually come out and run report timing and we'd have really terrible timing um, so we'd have to run a post placement optimization where we would do this uh, optimization effort say hi and then we would run opdesign minus pre CTS. Just uh, so you should know, in the Cadence tools, um, opdesign minus pre CTS is what would do high uh, fan out buffering. High fan out buffering. For example, on the reset trees, it would add buffers to the reset trees so we wouldn't have a real high fan out on those types of nets. If you would not run opdesign minus pre CTS, you would be left with those uh, high fan outs. Okay, um, this has been a, a replaced in Anovis with uh, the GigaPlace tool, which uh, or the GigaPlace engine, which runs timing-driven concurrent placement and optimization. So in this case, we can again set our DBs uh, about different things such as uh, global congestion effort and so forth. Um, plus, we set our different DBs such as optimization effort, and then we just run one um, command, place op design, and it will do concurrent placement and uh, uh, and timing optimization. Um, another point is that sometimes we move things for some reason or uh, do something that disrupts how things were done. Maybe we add some sort of a cell uh, using an ECO or so forth and we'll have um, a non-place cell, maybe some overlap or so forth. And then we want to do a placement legalization step in uh, the stylus common UI. This is uh, solved using the place detail command. So if we run place detail, it will do that uh, small simulated annealing or so forth algorithm to um, solve whatever type of uh, placement problem we have, such as an unplaced cell or an overlap and so forth. So that's all for this lecture on placement. And again, I'd really like to uh, acknowledge Ron Rutenbar, whose wonderful lectures from Logic with Layout um, really gave all the algorithmic basis behind this. Um, there's a lot of stuff from the IDESA courses and uh, Cadence and Synopsis documentation, of course, uh, give a large backing to all the practical aspects.